Welcome to a Telltale Books video. I'm starting a new series because I'm very excited about this author that I'm going to start reading. His name is David H. Keller. And I have done a different video already reviewing Keller's The Human Termites, which some of you may remember. That was a, a really excellent, really different early science fiction story, kind of crazy, kind of wild, kind of dated in some ways, um, but very different from what I expected, not what I expected for 1928. And so I wanted to get busy and read some other David H. Keller. Um, and I, I enjoyed the human termites enough that I wanted to go back and do another deep dive, starting from the beginning, reading everything I can get my hands on by David H. Keller. And so I'm starting at his first published story, The Revolt of the Pedestrians. Now, a little bit about Keller. He was a medical doctor. He spent quite a few years working as a country doctor in a small town. He also got a, uh, a degree to become a psychiatrist and spent time working as a psychiatrist. And he also was in the military. He was a soldier. So he had a pretty distinguished career. And he did most of this before he started publishing. Now, um, I'm reading him in Tales from Underwood, which was originally an Arkham House book published in 1952, but my copy is a, a later British reprint by Neville Spearman in the 1970s, I think, 1970s or 1980s or something like that. When was it? 1974. Neville Spearman published, reprinted Tales from Underwood. And so I'm reading Revolt of the Pedestrians in there. Um, and David Keller wrote an introduction to Tales from Underwood where he talks about his early um, careers and his early life. And he, and he says that he wrote a lot of stories before Revolt of the Pedestrians. And that he still had those stories, but that nobody would ever read them. He was going to see to it because he didn't feel that they were any good. And he may be right. I mean, a lot of authors, as, as we have seen in my deep dives going back to the earliest stuff, a lot of times we, a lot of times I've been reading things that were published in fanzines before the authors actually were published professionally and they're not always very good um, notably the stor short story wacky by arthur c clark which was published in a fanzine before he did any professional publishing and i thought that was a, a pretty inferior story it's for what Arthur Clarke would do even even a sh very short time later when he started publishing professionally. So David H. Keller has said that they exist, but they will never be read. So the interesting thing there now is if he did like most author authors and left all his papers to some university, there's nothing he can do to stop somebody today from going into that university collection of all of his papers and digging out those stories. And then you just got to get the rights from whoever's surviving and has the rights to all those papers. You just got to get their permission to go and publish them. And uh, you get around his, his promise that they would never be read. But like I say, probably no good reason to do that. He's probably right. You know, he wasn't a kid when he started publishing. David Keller was born in 1880 on December 23rd, which is when this video is going to premiere on YouTube. Is December, not December 23rd, 1880, but December 23rd, 2023. 
and he died in he died July 13th of 1966. So yes, he did write a lot of stuff before Revolt of the Pedestrians, but none of that stuff was ever published. The Revolt of the Pedestrians was his first published story. It's a novelette. It was published in the February 1928 issue of Amazing Stories. And it has been, it's largely forgotten today, but it has been considered to be a classic. It has been reprinted quite a few times, I know. But I had never read it. Um, I've known of Keller, but The Human Termites, I believe, was the first of his stories that I ever actually read. And so I'd never read Revolt of the Pedestrians before. I've always wanted to. Finally corrected that. I've read the Revolt of the Pedestrians. I mean, I've known of, I've known who David H. Keller was since I was like 14 years old. All right. So I just never got around to reading him, mainly because having written most of his work in the 1930s, a lot of the fiction from back then has not been reprinted very much. It's kind of hard to get a hold of. These days with the internet, you can get a hold of almost anything, but in the 1970s, 1980s, you couldn't go into a bookstore and buy David H. Keller books. It, that just didn't exist. And he was dead, so he wasn't publishing in the magazines anymore. Anyway, what is the revolt of the pedestrians about? It, it's a very obvious extrapolation from the um, increasing numbers of people buying automobiles. And in particular, in the early days of the automobiles, most people were still driving horse, horse drawn buggies. And the horses didn't know what the heck these were because they were new. Horses had never encountered these things before. And they were getting freaked out by cars that were coming by. And this was a problem. And the drivers just felt, well, get your horse out of the way. You know, they had kind of a selfish, jerky attitude about the situation. Probably not every driver, but many of them that did kind of take an attitude, which is unfortunate. Anyway, Keller then takes that situation and he extrapolates into a future where everybody who can drives. They don't walk. They drive everywhere. They even invent little personal auto cars that just fit them. And they develop a fashion industry for women of the cars that they put themselves in. And we're far enough in the future here, although Keller wisely doesn't say a date, too many science fiction authors make that make that mistake. They, they are writing in 1940 and they set their story in 1919. Of course, we're now in 2023 reading these stories and going, yeah, that never happened. Um, Keller wisely leaves that out and just doesn't even say, doesn't even state that this is the future. You just have to infer it from the fact that it isn't the present. <laughs> obviously isn't the present. And so we're far enough in the future that all these automo what they're called automobilists, they do not walk anymore. They refuse to walk and their legs have actually atrophied so that they can't walk anymore. But there are some people who, they're mostly the poor people, of course, that can't afford a car they still have to walk and they're walking across these roads and the, and the automobilists don't care they just mow them down and because the automobilists have the money and there's more of them than the walkers the pedestrians they pass laws making it illegal to walk and the the government actually even issues an order that anybody walking 
an automobilist can just mow them down and kill them without retribution. The law is on their side. They want to get rid of all those walkers. And they think that that succeeds. They think that they eliminate everybody who is still walking. But there's one kid who at the beginning of the story sees his mother get run down by run down and killed by an automobile. She pushed her son out of the way so that he would live. And she gets run over and killed. And he sees this and it makes him angry enough that he vows to do something about it. He goes off and finds a place where he can live away from the automobilists. It's in the mountains of the Ozarks. And um, other people join, other walkers, other pedestrians do join him there. And they create their own little community. And for a long time, they keep going that way. But at some point, they outgrow their hidden valley kind of situation in the Ozarks. And, and they decide they want to rejoin society. So the first thing they do is they, they send a spy out. And this is where this story gets really, really interesting. I mean, the story is already gonzo. Um, it reads like J.G. Ballard. And I, you just get these, you conjure up all these images of these people that are half machine, half human, um, kind of H.R. Giger type images, or, or maybe Art Deco, um, Philip Castle type blendings of man and machine and, and turning it into a fashion statement. It's, it's just, it conjures up all kinds of really cool, really weird imagery. And you just have this very, very sen surreal sense at the beginning of this. Like I say, like I say, it 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 comes. It initially comes across very Ballardian, you know, almost like Crash, only without the extreme eroticism and and such. Um, but it gets it gets kind of graphic. I mean, this woman is just run over. And these, these automobilists, they are a trophy. They are mutated and blended with machines. And, well, then the pedestrians send a spy back into automobilist society to find out and report on what's going on. The spy is a man, but in order to blend in, and I'm not exactly sure why Keller felt he had to go this route but in order for this man to blend in they he has to be able to masquerade as both a man and a woman so you know this is february 1928 amazing stories keller is creating a transvestite character in his story um and what's more is he doesn't stop there this character, while masquerading as a woman, falls in love with one of the automobilist women. And the woman returns the love thinking that he is a woman. So now you have this story that not only has a transvestite, but also has a lesbian, and they're in a, a relationship here. Obviously, they haven't had sex yet. Um, at one point... It's revealed that he is a man. He, he reveals to her that he is actually a man. And she is so pissed off about that because she thought she, she thought she was getting a woman that in her rage, she bites his juggler and kills him. I'm reading this going, oh my God. <laughs> this is 1928 and this is reading like something that would be written today. It's, it's just totally out there. And, uh, you know, then um, the pedestrians do something that causes all power, all electrical power, all power, period, to become inactive. It's something similar to blowing up an atomic bomb and it um, messes with all EMFs something along those lines and it it globally cuts all power 
So that now all these people that are totally dependent on their automobile creations, they can't move. And the leader of the of the pedestrians, it's been a number of generations, but he's related to the kid that went into the Ozarks initially, whose mother got killed and who vowed revenge. He got his revenge. You know, but before they did this, they asked, we want to rejoin society. And they were just told no. And so then he said, okay, we're going to use this thing we invented. It's going to kill all power. And he offered to help anybody that wanted help in getting, in being able to adapt to the situation. But they just went ahead and killed all power and they set off this machine. It, it eliminated all electricity. And, and they said, well, reverse it, turn your machine back on. He said, no, it killed power to our machine too. We can't use it ever again. And I'm spoiling this now. Okay, we're getting very close to the end, but the main character walks out of the building where he's having the, the meeting with all the leaders after they do this. And he walks down into the streets of New York and the description there of all the people trying to get out of their cars and trying to get around in their totally legless monstrosities. <laughs> Once again, is just not what I expect for 1928. You know, maybe it's not too shocking today, but constantly keeping in my mind, this was amazing stories in 1928. They had laws against this sort of stuff. And Keller went ahead and wrote it and put it into this, into amazing stories that got printed. Um, so just like with human termites, I mean, human termites did things that, I wasn't expecting, you know, I was expecting just a stock hope science fiction adventure story of monsters on the rampage and got something very different, very much more intelligent. And, and here again, I was, I was expecting just a stock anti-technology story of, of a civil war and got it but got something so much more than that so much more sophisticated so much more creative so much more intelligent than what other pulp writers would have done and in the hands of of somebody like sorry but if anybody likes this guy but harl vincent this story would not have been very good but in the hands of david h keller it's brilliant this story is amazing sorry had to do it um this is a must read this is a top tale this is incredible and this is the second of two stories i've read by keller that just totally blew my mind and surprised me so i'm reading the rest of what's in this book and i'm i'm ordering other books and trying to get a hold of everything by david h keller and i'm going to go through in order of publication everything i can get my hands on and i expect a lot more surprises to come so have you read revolt of the pedestrians leave your comments leave your thoughts about this story but well if you didn't like it I'm not going listen to listen to what you have to say because I think this is one of the most amazing science fiction stories I have read in a long time. And I think every everybody who likes science fiction should read it. And a lot of people who don't generally read science fiction should pick it up and try it too. I think you're going to be delightfully surprised by what it is. If you bear in mind, this was at a time when Lady Chatterley's Lover couldn't be printed because it was too risque. There were standards that you just didn't do. You didn't, you didn't write about gay or lesbian relationships in 1928. It just was not done. That stuff could not be published. Keller did it. And he didn't get thrown in prison. And neither did the, did Gernsback for editing and amazing stories. He didn't get thrown in prison either. They did it. They got it past everybody. 
and publish this brilliant story that was way ahead of its time as far as in including diverse characters. And well, even though the, the woman was not very sympathetically discussed in the in the story, the guy was. And I mean he was clearly a transvestite though. And he just didn't write stuff like that in 1928. And and so just this story is so far ahead of its time. It's just mind blowing. Just mind blowing. And even if you took those things out and still left it, just the description at the end of the uh, guy going out, walking into New York City and seeing the chaos that he caused. Um, it's just amazing. And it's, it's an interesting story in contrast with our world where we have bike lanes and pedestrian laws protecting them. Um, even remembering when I was young in the 1970s, riding my bike on streets, you took your life in your hands because you didn't have bike lanes. You were out in traffic and the cars really didn't care about you. You had to avoid the cars. You had to be on the defensive. You had to be on the alert all the time or you would get hit. That's just the way it was. You know, you had to, had to stay out of traffic. If you were going to ride on the roads, you had to be extra careful to avoid getting in the way of a car. And when you were a pedestrian, you followed the lights. Even when the light said walk, you still looked both ways and anybody turning across you, you backed off and let them turn. And they completed their turn. You waited until traffic was clear. You did not just walk across with your head down looking at your phone, not unless you wanted to die. And that's the way it used to be. When I, when, you know, in the, even in the 1970s, 1980s, when I was, when I was young, that's the way it was. I mean, people didn't go around wanting to kill pedestrians, but people, when you were out walking, especially if you went for a walk when it was snowing, people would look at you like there was something wrong with you. Why are you walking when it's snowing? Because it's beautiful. Well, it's cold and it's wet and, you know, why don't you drive, you know, walking to, walking to the store, why don't you drive to the store? I don't want to. I like walking in snow, you know, and people just couldn't get that. It that was so foreign because they just automatically got in their cars and drove, even if it was two blocks to the grocery store. They automatically jumped in their car and drove there rather than walk. And that was the mindset when I was young. And, and that was the developing mindset when this story was written. Keller was seeing that that's the way things could go. Now, fortunately, we've turned away from that. We've created a world that's a lot more amenable to bicyclists and pedestrians. And that's a good thing. Though pedestrians still need to get, still need to look up when they're crossing the road and, and pay attention to traffic. But we have kind of turned that around. And so we won't see this wor world that Keller is talking about develop, but for a long time it was a very real possibility. It was kind of in our national attitude that people shouldn't be walking. They should just get in their car and drive. Yeah, that's also when gasoline was 30 cent, 35 cents a gallon, too. Okay, so moving on. That was David H. Keller's first story. Um, I recommend it to everybody. I think it is one of the greatest short stories ever written. It really is. It's brilliant. It may not be perfect, may be a little dated in some ways, but it still is just so surprising in so many ways. I recommend reading it. And of course, you can find, I think it's public domain, but I'm not sure. But I have seen Amazing Stories February 1928 as a PDF online. And of course, Tales from Underwood is available as a used book. Um, 
because Keller is not well known anymore. They're not super expensive. There's also a book called The Keller Memento. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the company that publishes it. Let me see if I can find it in my email. I just ordered it from this publisher. Just ordered it yesterday. Ramble House. That's it. Go to ramblehouse.com. They actually have quite a lot of, of science fiction, horror, fantasy books that they have kept in print. And Keller Memento is one of them. And you can buy this brand new. And it's a it's a big collection of a lot of Keller stories. I believe Revolt of the Pedestrians is in it, as well as a lot of other great Keller short stories. Um, he did write some novels as well. I am going to gradually cover everything I can get my hands on. And the next one, which is also in Tales from Underwood, is called The Yeast Men, which was published a couple months later in Amazing Stories in 1928. It's a short story, that'll be my next David H. Keller. I hope you'll and I hope you'll join me for that. And uh, come back for the, for more David H. Keller and all the other authors that I'm talking about in future videos from Telltale Books. I'll be here talking about them.